So at this point, we're going to move into part two of our introduction to hacking techniques. And we're going to cover a couple of different things here. We're going to start off by talking about buffer overflows. We want to get a good understanding of buffer overflows so that ultimately we can exactly predict and understand how our tools are going to work for us when utilizing these techniques. We're also going to spend some time and get into a little bit more detail on rootkits, talk about why those exist and where you might find them and what's important to know about this type of technology. We're also going to spend some time talking about spoofing techniques or ways in which spoofing can enable hackers to be more effective and make it challenging for IT security professionals. We're also going to focus in on denial of service attacks. I'm sure you've heard about DOS or DDOS attacks, so we're going to spend some time talking about that and discovering how that works. We're also going to talk about web hacking, or more specifically, hacking the technology associated with web hosting, such as the web server or application or service that's actually hosting the web code itself. So moving on into buffer overflows, it's definitely important to understand that buffer overflows exist on just about every program and operating system out there. And really, the point there is... It boils down to bad coding or poor validation of coding or error checking. And the reason it exists almost across the board is because it's so very difficult to validate hundreds of thousands of millions of lines of code. So oftentimes these might go completely unnoticed until someone gets around to attempting a buffer overflow against that system. Any given piece of software or operating system could, in theory, have hundreds of buffer overflows in it just waiting to be discovered. The basic concept of the buffer overflow is when a programmer does not clearly define the boundaries on buffers or variables in a particular application or operating system. Or they might simply make what's called the fence post error. And what that basically amounts to is if you want to make a fence 100 meters long and your sections of fence are 10 meters long, how many fence posts do you need? Well, the correct answer is 11. Although your immediate thought might have been that we only need 10 because 10 times 10 is 100. So that would effectively give us our 100 meters, but we need 11 fence posts to be on all sides of all 10 of those individual fence sections. So those are the type of mistakes that programmers commonly make that end up leading to buffer overflows or stack exploits. What we're going to do is utilize this ability of out-of-bounds data or data that doesn't have a home to insert our data or redirect the execution pointer to a program buffer that we can utilize for something else. An example of this would be we want to go in and we want to perform a buffer overflow exploit on a particular service on a Windows machine. Well, if we want to set up a return shell, for example, then we set the buffer overflow to go in, and in the buffer in which we have stolen effectively, we'll build shell code and return a shell prompt back to the system that actually hacked. And we'll do that by redirecting the pointer that actually parses through memory. So it's a little bit of a complicated process, but once you get the hang of it, you can actually build these buffer overflows relatively easily. Ultimately, our goal here is to insert malicious code or execute commands on the remote system utilizing these overflows and lack of checking. The results of this can be denial of service in where it causes the program to freeze or the machine to crash, or in best case scenario, permits the exploit to lead to a compromise or to some execution of information on that system. In order to actually build buffer overflows, you need to be a pretty good programmer and have a good knowledge of stack and buffer vulnerabilities, as well as stack and buffers in general, depending on the code that you're using. You also need to have the skills to be able to research and apply those vulnerabilities to a current attack, meaning it's not enough to know how to overflow a buffer. You have to know how to utilize that overflow to get a usable end result, meaning a vulnerability or an exploit or remote code execution. There really aren't a lot of things we can do to protect ourselves from buffer overflows other than stay on our programmers about working with that security mindset, double checking their code, and validating that those fence post type errors 
aren't present in your particular software. And in addition, we want to have a penetration tester or an ethical hacker perform vulnerability assessment on our applications and our operating systems before we roll it to production.